major focus here has been in education. Pay attention to education because that has more effect on our future than any other topic that we deal with in this body. State Senator Lindsey Tippins, one of the state's biggest champions of education, asks his colleagues to take care of kids in education in Georgia as he announces he won't seek another term. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers on this Legislative Day 17. I'm Donna Lowry. We'll have more on Senator Tippins in just a moment. Governor Brian Kemp is now pushing a bill to allow parents to opt out of mask requirements for their children in schools. We'll hear from lawmakers on both sides of the issue. We'll also talk about a bill with 40 signatures from lawmakers who want to make sure the costs are the same for diagnostic breast examinations and mammograms. It's a bipartisan bill, and we have two senators from each side of the aisle joining us. But we head to the Gold Dome first for the latest from Capitol correspondent Brenda Waters. Hi, Brenda. Hey, Donna. Interesting day at the Capitol, stretching from hunting and trapping possum to the announcement of a senator's retirement. I rise this morning to tell you that I will not qualify to run for re-election this fall. I want to tell you that if this has been one of the most wonderful experiences that I've had in my life, and I value the privilege of serving with each of you. Senator Lindsey Tippins was first elected to the Senate in 2010, representing Marietta in Cobb County. He also served as chair of the Senate Higher Education Committee. I want to thank each of you for the friendship. And when I say each of you, I mean Democrats and Republicans. So many times today we're divided by partisan issues. So many times today we focus on things that aren't really important. But I cherish the times that we've been able to sit down and talk about issues that we obviously have differences of opinion. Both, I've had that with both Republicans and Democrats, but I pr appreciate the honest and open conversations that we've had. I appreciate the fun times we've shared. I appreciate the, the, the friendships that we've built, and I appreciate the hard work that we have done together for the state of Georgia. Right after the announcement, Senator Tippins was back to business. Cobb County maps business. Two bills, HB 1028 and HB 1154, that have been vigorously fought over in the House, made their way to the Senate. Those maps would draw new district lines for the Cobb County Board of Commissioners and the Cobb County Board of Education. To withdraw and commit these bills to Slogo General, that's where they were supposed to have been routed originally, and I'd ask you for your favorable consent to do that. After Tippins asked for the two bills to be put into the Slogo General Committee, Senator Jennifer Jordan pushed back. No, they were supposed to go. <laughs> to Slogo Local because they are local bills, right? Local bills. These are Cobb County bills that the local delegation is supposed to actually be dealing with as opposed to pulling them off. And why do we pull them off? Because we know that we don't have the support of the local elected officials. Again, Gwinnett, Augusta, Cobb. I absolutely object, and specifically with Cobb County, this is headed straight to litigation. They literally have drawn a sitting county commissioner out of her district, a woman of color. It's just not acceptable, y'all. But Republicans were successful in moving the bill forward. Also in the Senate, SB 461 passed unopposed 54-0. The measure would add human trafficking to the list of offenses bailable only before a superior court judge. Human trafficking is a serious offense that must be treated as seriously as other crimes that violate moral turpitude. Lower judges like magistrate judges are often unelected and may not even be attorneys. Superior court judges our attorneys that are elected to office ensuring that they will always be held accountable by the electors of that circuit. Judges in Superior Court are more likely to look at the facts in the case of their entirety before setting bail. 
Now, you may recall this from yesterday when Governor Kemp urged legislators to ban mask mandates in schools, saying it is time for parents to decide if they want to send their children to school wearing masks. Well, today, Representative Jasmine Clark responded to what the governor said. Our children depend on adults to make good decisions that will protect them. They are, at our mo they are our most vulnerable and at the mercy of the adults to make good, sound policy. And that is why I'm concerned that we would allow politics to endanger children. We cannot take an individualistic approach to public health by allowing some to endanger others. It's like allowing a person to poop in the pool and assume that everyone else swimming in it will not be affected. House Bill 1147 passed, and it's an interesting measure, to say the least. It would permit hunters hunting and trapping of raccoons and possums year-round. It was presented by Representative Trey Rhodes, but got some great feedback from Representative Al Williams and also Speaker Ralston. Is this a pro-raccoon bill or an anti-raccoon bill? That, that is for each member to decide themselves, Mr. President. That's an excellent answer, by the way. Yes, sir. Some of you have never experienced a baked possum, and some of you have had problems even imagining a baked coon with sweet potatoes around it. Some of you have developed a bourgeois attitude after getting out of your former circumstances. <clears throat> there was a time when that, it was not a sporting animal, but a subsistence animal. And I want you to know that my grandmother was one of the finest cookers of the raccoon in America. Well, Donna, that's the meat of my Capitol report. Back to you. All right, Brenda, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. We're going to spend some time now looking at Governor Brian Kemp's announcement yesterday that he wants Georgia parents to have the option of opting out of school district mask mandates. In a few minutes, we'll talk to a legislator who is opposed to the idea. First, Republican Senator Clint Dixon is sponsoring the Unmask Georgia Student Act legislation. It's SB 514 for the governor. I spoke with him earlier today about the bill. It's a simple bill, and, and what it is is if if a local uh, school district decides to incorporate a mass mandate, they must, if, if this bill passes, they must incorporate if a, uh, an opt-out option for parents, so parents can opt their children out. Why? Why did you want to be a sponsor of this bill? I know you're a floor leader for the governor, but what for you personally is this about? Yeah, for me personally, I mean, education, it, you know, is my priority this legislative session. And it's, you know, quite frankly, been become the biggest issue I've got locally in Gwinnett County with the issues that we have on our school board. And the mass mandates, uh, you know, quite frankly, is one of the hot button topics for a lot of the parents. I've heard from thousands of parents that are having you know, wide range of issues with their children, their students that are in school, whether it's they're asthmatic or if it's learning disabilities or just communicating, they, they've had major issues with those mask mandates. And we feel like, or I feel like personally, that, that parents should be in charge of the well-being of their students and also be in charge of the education process of their students. They so know best. So instead of going for, hey, let's just not allow any school districts to do it, you're going for opt out. Why is that the option? Yeah, that, you know, I say, you know, because, you know, we don't want to, you know, we, we do believe in home rule and, you know, it, it, it would be a statewide initiative. I know there's only, you know, a handful of districts that do have uh, mass mandates still in place. I mean, some of them have, you know, the optional mandates, you know, if you, if you choose to wear a mask, you can. Uh, but th this would just, you know, put parents in charge, you know, in charge of the well-being of their children. What do you say to the teachers who are saying, hey, listen, what, what does this mean for us? Yeah, I tell you, um, you know, as far as for the teachers, I've actually had several messages come in where teachers were, I wouldn't say upset with me, but they were wanting it expanded to make masks optional for them as well. And that, that's what I've been hearing from since, I mean, it's only been a day since we dropped the bill, but that's been some of the responses I've gotten from teachers in the past day. And also something I want to highlight as well is this, this bill, if it's signed into law, would not be a bill that goes on and on and on. It, it's intended just for 
the pandemic that we're in, and it does have a sunset of June 30th of 2023. I have a statement from the Professional Association of Georgia Educators, and they said decisions about school mask requirements are best made at the local level with extensive and continued input from educators, parents, and community members. SB 514 does not prevent districts from continuing mask mask requirements, but it does allow parents to opt out, which may further the ongoing tension in some schools and communities. And that's from PAGE Executive Director Craig Harper. Your response? Yeah, I, I disagree with that. I think that the mask mandates have actually created a lot of tension in the schools. I mean, I, I hear from thousands of parents, like I've said multiple times, I mean, it education issues in Gwinnett County. I mean, there's a laundry list of, of issues we've got that we're trying to tackle, but the mask mandate is on the forefront. And there, I've heard from thousands, tens of thousands of parents that are opposed to the mask mandates. They want their children unmasked. And I think it would actually alleviate issues in the schools. So being able to opt out, you're saying, will keep people from fighting about this issue, arguing about this issue, getting into so. discussions about this issue? Yes, ma'am, I think so. Yeah, and your response from parents since the announcement yesterday? Yeah, I tell you, you know, from what I've heard from parents, I mean, they're they're elated. The ones that that have been reaching out to me, and I've had a few that that are opposed to it, but a majority of the ones that have reached out to me are are definitely in favor of this opt out option for their children. Because, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be, uh, you know, alongside the governor and, and fighting for the well being and the rights of parents with this bill. Senator Clint Dixon. Joining me now is Democratic Representative Derek Jackson of Tyrone. Thanks for being here. And first, I want to talk about where you sit in the Georgia House. You're one of about a dozen lawmakers who sit in the gallery of the House. During the session, we have a few pictures. Masks are required in the House chamber, but I should mention not in the Senate. And even with that, you sit upstairs in the gallery and wear a mask. And during last year's session, there was more spread out. There were people in the gallery. There were people socially distanced on the floor. There were people in one of the largest hearing rooms. Mm -hmm. And but now it's it's just mostly on the floor. But you chose you choose to be up there in the gallery. Tell us why. You know, one of the things I realized, Donna, <clears throat> that we're still in this pandemic. If you think about where we were just in the beginning of this year, where the average death in Georgia was 32. Just yesterday on Valentine's is now 93 a day. And so we're still dealing with this pandemic. And so for those of us who have elderly parents and aunts and uncles, um, not saying that our colleagues who, who do not, but we value life. We value our senior citizens. And so the 13 of us that chose to sit up in the gallery is because we're taking care of our elderly parents. We, we don't want to risk their lives, more or less ours. And so for our colleagues who are all on the chamber floor, because you're right, last year we were spread out over three different locations because uh, uh, we were dealing with this pandemic. Nothing has changed. Uh, we may have different variants, but the pandemic still exists. Okay, so let's talk about the Unmasked Georgia Student Act. What are your thoughts about that bill? So, you know, one of your things uh, when the governor uh, introduced this Senate Bill 514, uh, the Unmasked Students Act, uh, much of us uh, strongly oppose. Um, being a parent, being a father, you know, one of the things I realized that local control is important. And it's amazing that the majority party that often talks about government control and things of that nature, this is an overreach. Uh, they like to always say that Democrats are overreaching, but this is an overreach because the school system, the school boards, they know best. And so it would be hard for us in Atlanta to try to dictate for all 159 counties while we're still dealing with this pandemic. And so why should we institute a Senate Bill 514 to unmask, what's going to be next? What, what happens when a child gets the pink eye? Do someone in Valdosta or, or Albany need to send a letter up to Atlanta to say, hey, we have a child that's with the pink eye. Should we let them stay in? Should the parents opt out and keep their child in? No. And so we're dealing with this pandemic. And 514, Senate Bill 514, 
I think it's a bad bill. But more importantly, um, this political pressure during this political season is nothing more than allowing for the public schools to be used as a political football. So there, there was the question, and while the governor denies it, that uh, some have speculated this bill is a response to his um, Democratic challenger, Stacey Abrams, not wearing a mask while taking a picture in a school with masked children. She has apologized for that and said that in the rush to, and after speaking, you know, she was excited about the picture and she went ahead and, and did that. And that he called it, he said, quote, it's hypocrisy that can happen when a visitor comes into the school, even though he says it's not because of that. What are your thoughts, though? Yeah, again, he, he, he quoted it himself, right? Um, what happens when uh, a governor, and this is really more about where we are as we continue to deal with this pandemic. So when you think about um, using legislation to go after your political op opponent, I just think that's wrong. I don't deal with extremes. We got to find a happy balance. What do we do when um, deaths start to surge again? Do we now tell parents, hey, you, we're going to rescind Senate Bill 514? No. No. We're going to make sure that we institute, uh, depending on these variants that come in, to keep our children safe. Right. So, so Senator Dixon says it does end. It has a sunset of June 30th, 2023. The other part of it is he says it gives parents the option. The parents should have the ability to say what their kids can and cannot do. How do you answer that? <laughs> As a father with seven children, my wife and I have seven children, we still dictate to our children what they can and cannot do for safety reasons. And so when you think about a sunset that's next year, what happens if the next variant becomes stronger than the Omicron or Delta? So it's hard to justify when you're dealing with public safety what government should do. There should be a balance. So it's no different than we had, my wife and I had to make sure that our children got the vaccine in order to go to public school. If a teenager gets into a fight at school, parents have to deal with the school administrator because the school administrator is going to uh, adjudicate that situation. When do we empower those local elected officials? We often talk about home rule and local control but Senate Bill 514 does exactly the opposite of what the other party preaches. Well, I appreciate you coming in and talking about it. I'm sure we'll talk about it in the coming weeks. Thank you, thank you so much again. Absolutely. So, coming up, dozens of senators have signed on to a bill to even the cost of certain testing for women. You're watching Lawmakers on GPB. Cigna is a proud partner of Georgia Public Broadcasting and Georgia Lawmakers. Cigna's mission is to improve the health, well-being, and peace of mind of those we serve. More at Cigna.com to learn how you can help support your employees' physical and emotional well-being. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. Georgia Humanities, connecting people and communities across Georgia to encourage conversation, education, and understanding. Find out more at www.georgiahumanities.org. We are the Southern Environmental Law Center. At SELC, we not only take on the toughest environmental challenges, we win, forcing the removal of more than 250 million tons of toxic coal ash, defeating repeated attempts to bring offshore drilling to our coasts, and securing clean air and water protections for communities across our region. Your most powerful environmental defender is rooted right here in the South. Welcome back. 
Welcome back to Lawmakers. We're going to look now at a bill, a bipartisan bill, looking to make sure the cost of breast exams remains the same for both diagnostic tests and mammograms. Joining me are two Marietta legislators, Democrat, Democratic Senator Michael Redd of District 33 and Republican Senator Kay Kirkpatrick of District 32, right next to each other. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on Lawmakers. So Representative Kirkpatrick, you're a doctor, an orthopedic hand surgeon, very delicate work. Um, but we appreciate your medical expertise on this issue in particular. So explain the, the difference, define for us the difference between what is known as a breast uh, magnetic re resonance imaging, or MRI, and an ultrasound exam and a mammogram. Well, Donna, the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer has changed a lot since I moved to Atlanta in 1986. And uh, it used to be mammograms were about it, that and an exam by the physician. But now for people, especially that are at high risk, it's gotten to be that a, a sort of a standard set of exams uh, frequently includes an ultrasound. And then if there's any question, then an MRI of the breast is frequently ordered. And the advantage to having sort of a panel of things that you do is that early detection can really change the course of the disease and in the long haul is much less expensive than waiting until someone has a later stage of breast cancer. So you're, you, the mammogram sh will show one thing, but an ultrasound, an MRI, an MRI will show one thing and an ultrasound will show something different. So this is what we're actually saying, that it's, it's not the same. They pick up different things. Correct. Okay. So let's, let's talk about this a little bit, um, explaining the, what this bill is all about. Uh, Senator Rett, why, why does this bill expand on that and why do we want this so much? Well, it basically comes down to women's health and that's the most important part because initially when women go in to get screened, the Affordable Care Act and the insurance will use as a screening measure a mammogram. But if you run into an issue, then the qu what happens is you need a more in-depth view of what's going on, that's when the MRI or the, son or the sonogram, which is a picture from the ultrasound, will come in to take a look. But the challenge is a lot of times when you go for those diagnostic tests, the insurance companies will make you have to pay a copay or your deductible, which can be very expensive. And so in a lot of cases, people will wait a while before they get through that deductible. But in the meantime, if you have an issue and you're waiting around, it can metastasize or spread. So that's why we're trying to get this bill so that they can put perhaps MRIs or sonograms as a part of your regular initial screening or early stage screening. So there's uh, pre-authorization too, and that takes time too. Would that take that away? Uh, no. Okay. No, prior authorization, as you know, that's something I've worked on ever since I got to the Senate. and. Uh, we now have some guidelines and some transparency around prior authorization, which comes into play with any medical test or any surgery that you want to have. So uh, we've never tried to tell the uh, private companies that they can't do prior authorization. We just want to shine some light on um, what's required and what the criteria are. So um, mammograms are certainly very commonly done and should be very commonly done. Ultrasounds are probably more commonly done than they used to be. MRIs are usually not a screening test, but if something pops up on a mammogram or an ultrasound that's questionable, then that's when the MRI comes into play. And I think the, I haven't heard from anybody on this bill yet, it's early in the process, and it's actually Senator McNeil's bill, um, who couldn't be here tonight, but the, um, point is that prevention and catching things early has really changed the course of breast cancer since uh, since I moved here 30 something years ago and that's what we want we want early detection because that leads to less aggressive treatment sometimes and longer life and better quality of life so that is why I think the insurance companies many times will pay for screening tests um, in order to prevent the maybe 
up to five times greater cost on the back end if things are not diagnosed early. And mammograms are free for certain people out, out over a certain age in terms of what their insurance will pay for, but with these other costs, with these other exams, not, not free. Right. Yeah, and so that's the big problem here. Yeah, they're still not going to be free, but the bill, my understanding of it is that it just, they have to be handled the same way. Okay. All right. So Susan G. Komen, uh, the, you know, nonprofit that's deal, that deals with breast cancer, is getting involved in this. Talk about why, why that group is involved and how. Uh, breast cancer is a very important topic. And one of the things I learned in the Air Force when I worked with pilots and navigators is that good health has a direct correlation to the success of the mission. And now that we're empowering women to move in different areas, we also want to make sure that they have good health when they go along. Susan G. Coleman has certain programs like the Center for Black Women Wellness and Stand For Her that can provide free ma mammograms and screening so that women, if they do have a problem, they're able to get the help they need and, and refer it in the right direction. Yeah, so they're, they're going to put some of their mm -hmm. efforts into helping with this, if this bill is able to pass, it sounds like, right? I, I think it's a national effort that they're taking, uh, undertaking, and this type of bill has already passed in several other states. I don't know what all of them are. I know that um, Texas is one of them, along with Arkansas and Louisiana, I believe. I'm not sure how many other states have passed it, but it's uh, really just trying to be sure that people get the care that they need early rather than late. I know a few years ago, the, um, yeah, the legislature passed making sure women knew more about dense pre breast tissues, that they, the tissue that they were getting tested, that mammograms weren't enough, that you might get a, a letter saying you should go in again. Making a difference? I don't have the follow-up on that, but um, that is a bill that we passed yeah. that should make a difference so that people are aware that they might be at higher risk for screening tests not picking up their disease right out of the gate. The other bill that we passed uh, last year or the year before was called Lacey's Law. Do you remember that? That's right. And that was um, acknowledging that certain people are at much higher risk for breast cancer than others at an earlier age. And a lot of these are genetic types of predispositions to get cancers of different types, not just breast cancer. And so great strides are being made, and the imaging sort of profile has changed. I don't know what we're going to be looking at in 30 years from now. We may be able to just plug somebody's genes in and see what they're going to end up with. But, uh, you know, the law always lags behind the science, so we're just trying to catch it up. And the other thing is, I think we think of this as something that women deal with, but men get breast cancer also. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm a doctor. I'm for everybody's health, not not just women's yeah. health. And uh, men have sometimes different things that they struggle with. Certainly, it's much less common in men. But um, we need to be sure that we're doing what we can to prevent advanced disease, no matter whether it's women or men. And you mentioned dens density at one time. I don't know how the technology has changed if maybe they can pick up on it better. But black women, because of the density of the tissue in their breasts, it was hard sometimes through a regular mammogram, to, which is kind of like an x-ray, to determine whether or not they had an issue. So further diagnostic was required. But because of cost, a lot of times they put it off. And therefore, if they do have an issue, it can spread. It's waiting too <clears throat> late. Yeah, so we're getting mm -hmm. to it early. But it sounds like you've got lots of signers, so it sounds like pretty good on this one. Yeah. Well, we, uh, Senator Rett and I work together on veterans issues and a lot of other things. He sits next to me in the Senate and, um, you know, there are a lot of things, people don't know this many times, but there are a lot of things in the Senate that we agree on okay. that uh, cross party lines. Well, we'll have you come back to talk about that. We want to thank you both for being here and thank you for joining us tonight for Lawmakers. Join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter and we'll see you tomorrow because that'll be Legislative Day 18. Have a good night.